This is it, the big day. Citywide Blackout, it is the annual Rhode Island Author Expo. It is happening. Go to riauthorexpo.com. There's a full schedule of events. There are author meet and greets. There are panels, interviews, just like the one we have right here. I'm Max Bone, and I'm now talking to the author of, uh, of the book, Silver Lining, three-time Olympic swimmer, two-time Olympic medalist, and Olympic team captain. Wow. <laughs> Well, thank you. How do we top this? Uh, you do, trust me. <laughs> I always say the only thing that I do better than pretty much everybody else is just swim. That is the only, I can swim faster than you maybe, but that's it. Definitely in my case you can. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, Elizabeth Beisel, thank you for joining me. It is great to have you here. And um, I want to talk all about the book. Let's do it. Reading all about it, this is a cool thing. So, the first question though, how, what made you want to write this book, you know? What made you want to go from Olympic athlete to published author? Yeah, it was actually, it was never on the radar for me, writing a book. Um, I was doing a lot of public speaking in clinics around the country, just talking to kids or teams or companies, and I'm like animated and I tell good stories, I guess, and after all of my speeches, a lot of people were starting to come up to me and say, hey, do you have a book? And I'd be like, no, I don't. And I heard it for like a year straight, and it finally got to the point where I was like, you know what, I'm gonna do this. So it's basically me opening up my MacBook computer and writing like, chapter one, like I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but it was like, it was awesome. You know, I learned so much and it was cathartic, you know, writing about stuff a part, that was a part of my swimming career that I hadn't really revisited because it was either like too traumatic, I guess. Um, but it was, it was really fun writing. Now this book uh, um, looks at a lot of the pressures and stresses that you went through as an, as an, an Olympic athlete. Mm -hmm. Can't imagine what that is like. Give us a look as to what it is like to be there at the Olympics. Yeah. And knowing that, you know, the whole world is looking at you. Yeah, it's it's very nerve wracking because up until that, swimming is such a small sport. Like it, it's not something that's viewed by millions all the time. It's a once in every four year sport, and that means people watch it at the Olympics. And then after that, it's kind of just like, oh yeah, you're a swimmer, that's cool. Like, are you gonna go to the Olympics? Like, it's really all that people care about. So once you get to those Olympics, everything is on the line because that is your one opportunity to prove yourself. And in swimming especially, you know, we don't have a World Series every year or an NCAA big tournament every year, or whatever it is. So we really have to capitalize on that time that we're at the Olympics because that's how we get all of our sponsorship. That's how we make our money. Um, and I think, you know, one of the common misconceptions about Olympians is that, especially swimmers, is that, oh, you're an Olympian? You definitely are so rich. Like, you're set for life. And it's like, actually, it's the complete opposite. You're probably doing better than I am um, because so much goes into training. And if you don't have sponsorship or you're not winning Olympic medals, you're not making money. Um, so it really is a sacrifice and it's it's very nerve wracking to know that millions of people are watching you doing that as well. So, wow. Yeah, it's crazy. How do you cope with it? How do you keep it from just totally crippling you? It's honestly repetition. Um, leading up to the Olympics, we have world championships and we have nationals. We have a lot of big meets, um, none of which really compare to the Olympics, but you can at least kind of mentally prepare yourself. And I think it's one of those things where you have to be able to rise to that occasion at the Olympic Games if you want to be successful in the sport. Because you can make it to the Olympics and then crumble and nothing's going to come of it. And that's the harsh reality of our sport is that you have to be able to mentally handle stepping up at a final at the Olympic Games knowing 30,000 people are in the arena watching you live and then millions of people are watching you at home. and. You can't let the what ifs happen or what if I fail because I, I remember one, before one of my races at the Olympics, I kept thinking like about everybody in Rhode Island watching and I did not want to embarrass myself because I knew so many people were watching and that's kind of a scary feeling, but I was like, no, you're fine. Like you're already at the Olympics. It's already like you've done well already. Don't overthink it. And it's swimming the same race that I've swam my entire life just in front of the eyes of a couple more million people. So it's just a little different, but you can handle it if you prepare, prepare properly. Let's compare your first time there versus your most uh, recent time. What's the difference in terms of how you handled all that? Yeah, my first Olympics, I was 15 years old. 
Um, it was in 2008, so I was a sophomore in high school. I was a deer in headlights. I saw everybody that I had posters of on my wall, and now all of a sudden I'm on a team with them. And that was a really hard thing for me to grasp was, wait, Michael Phelps and I are on the same Olympic team, but he's kind of my hero still. How is this gonna work? So that entire first Olympics that I went to was me just watching everybody and trying to do what everybody did. And while that's great, what Michael does before his race doesn't always necessarily work for me. So it was a big learning process being able to be on a team with such incredible athletes that I looked up to um, because I took things from each and every athlete and then kind of put my own twist on it. Whereas in 2016 at my last Olympics, um, I was the captain and I was kind of the trusted leader to like show everybody the ropes of the Olympics and help people um, and make them feel comfortable, which was the absolute opposite of who I was at my first Olympics. You know, I was the one needing the help. And, you know, I remember when I was 15 thinking if I'm ever in a position where I can help somebody on their first Olympic team feel more comfortable, feel, you know, that they belong, because that's also a kind of thing. Imposter syndrome was a huge part of my 2008 Olympics. Um, because I just didn't feel like I belonged. I was 15 years old. I was many years younger than the next athlete. So I kind of felt out of place. Um, so in 2016, I really made it um, a priority for me to make those youngsters and those newbies feel really welcomed. Okay. All right. So writing, writing the book, not something you planned on, did you like map out what you're going to write about? You know, like what you want to say in your book? I ha eventually I did. At first, <laughs> no. But I did start, um, once I figured out that opening my computer and just typing away wasn't really the way to do it. <laughs> just like um, hands poised. Yeah, like, like and I got nothing. Elizabeth was born. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's not going to work. So for me, it was, okay, I need to outline some of the key points that I want to hit, um, the key stories that I want to tell, um, and do it in a way that really... It's obviously a book about my swimming career, but I want it to be a book that anybody can pick up. You don't have to know the sport of swimming. You don't have to know me to get something out of this, out of this book. I wanted it to be lessons that I had learned, adversities that I had faced, um, that other people might face in their own life, just in a different realm. Um, so that was kind of, I outlined everything. Give an example of one of the lessons you've learned that, um, that you think the everyday person could um, like um, apply to their own lives. Yeah. I think, you know, it, there's so many good ones in there. Um, I think working hard and knowing that that hard work is going to pay off eventually is a big one for me because there were so many times in my swimming career where I just could not see the light at the end of the tunnel. I was either injured or I was hating the sport, honestly, to be candid. And I just did not want to do it anymore. And so many times my coaches would give me just one little reason to stay in it. And that was just the little token of, you know, it, that was what I needed to guide myself through staying in the sport. And I'm so glad that I did because the hard work that I was doing that I didn't really realize at the time ended up helping me way more than I thought it would at the end. And so if you're committing yourself to something that you love and you're going to hate it and that's the reality. Sometimes you're going to hate it. Sometimes you're going to love it. Um, but for me, I was just so glad that I stuck through it during those hard times because it paid off exponentially. Okay. Was this any more or less nerve wracking than being at the Olympics, especially when you got to the point where it's like, it's off to the publisher. There's no more tweaks. It's out there. Yes. 100%. <laughs> uh, and I will say why. In swimming, it is very clear cut. Mm -hmm. You are either the slowest or you're the fastest. There is no opinion, it is fact. And when you put out a book, it's not fact. Some people may love it, some people may not. Um, and so for me, I was really worried about how it would be received, how people liked it or didn't like it. Um, but I'm happy to say that it seems as though people have really liked it, which is a huge relief on my part, but also because, you know, I put years of work into this, you know, this wasn't like, oh, I woke up one morning and two months later I had a book, you know, <laughs> like it was years. And so, you know, to know that that hard work that I put into the book um, has made a difference in at least one person's life um, makes it all worth it. Years, really? Years. Yeah. So wow. I probably started in 
2018 and I released it in February 2020, just a few months ago. Wow. Yeah. Just as everything went downhill. Yes. Just exactly <laughs> like one month. I think the release date was February 11th and then March 13th was when everything kind of went crazy. Good so, timing. Yeah. Great time. So, great timing. So um, uh, with that in mind, did you have a lot lined up in terms of like a book tour, signings that all had to just get pushed aside? Yeah. I had a lot lined up. Oh, um, no. It's unfortunate, but you, you can't do anything about it. Yeah, and true. I know that those things will be rescheduled eventually. Um, but I had a great launch. I was able to do a book signing here in Rhode Island, um, like two weeks after in February. So I was glad I, I was glad I got to do that. But all of the book signings that I had all scheduled were just canceled. But that's okay. I have an online sale. You can get it if you need it. Like it's there's other ways to get it. But yeah, I'll get to that for sure. That's too bad. I know because because I have heard from so many musicians and writers. I know that had like tours put together, big shows, CD releases, and all that just gone. And I remember back in like March, we thought, oh, it'll be a few weeks or a month right. or two, and now here we are, December. Yeah, and still here. <laughs> still waiting. Yeah, it was, a, it, it was a tough time for artists, for sure, just because that's this is their livelihood, and mm -hmm. you can't hit pause like that for exactly. so long, so. Exactly. Now, given how long you worked on this, did you find yourself going back and forth you know, like editing things, tweaking things, tossing things? It was actually pretty smooth in terms of that. I, I had that clear outline and I knew the stories that I wanted to hit. Um, I think, you know, I am kind of a perfectionist. So when it came down to editing, I was like literally reading every chapter. I would do one chapter every hour and just edit that chapter. And I would do it for as long as I could like see my computer screen. And that was, cause I did not want one spelling mistake or grammatical error. Um, so that was like the one thing that I kept going back to. And I was like, just, just one more week of me combing through this. Just one, and my publisher was like, it's perfect, you're good. So, I mean, anybody wants that though. If you're good, there's no like do overs when you release a book. So you want it to be perfect. So that was the only thing that I was really stressing over in terms of like going back to things. Now your publisher, I imagine they, now, now, did they, did, did they have to like take the book out of your hands? Like, no, it's done. No more. <laughs> they were like, yes, it is done. We have all read through it. Like there was a team of 10 people. They were like, Elizabeth, everything is fine. I was like, okay, fine. Just take it away. <laughs> are you just, sure? Yes, are you I really was like, sure? I'm done. <laughs> like my eyeballs are beat red. But yeah, I was, I was very thankful to have them by my side and Really, because I've obviously never written a book before, so I didn't know what it entailed or what that process was like. Um, so they really were patient with me, which I really appreciated. What was some of the feedback you got either from the publisher or the team that really helped you? Yeah, they were, I mean, they were amazing, but they, so they had never really worked with an athlete before. So this was in a whole new wheelhouse for them. And they were just astounded about the stuff that they read and I think they were really excited about how easy it was to work with an athlete um, because I think sometimes athletes have that kind of like, I don't know, are they approachable? Are they not? Are their egos big? Are they not? So, I mean, for me, I think in the swimming world, we're pretty humble athletes. And so he was like, wow, yeah, I couldn't believe it. Like you got back to me. Like everything was so easy. Um, but yeah, they really loved like working with athletes and it's really cool now because this publisher that I used has now published two other is in the process of publishing one right now and then has another one down the line and they're both swimmers. So it's kind of cool that that has made something into itself, which is, it makes me happy. <laughs> is there one chapter that you think above all others should be read? The last one. I, you, were, you were quick on that. Yeah, I like the last that. one. All right. I, I mean, I think everyone, every single one has a purpose, mm -hmm. but I think the way that the last chapter is written just like really ties the book up into a, with a nice neat bow, but you could read that last chapter mm -hmm. on its own and feel really empowered and good. And so I'm hoping that's what people feel after reading it, but mm -hmm. If you don't feel like reading the 200 pages, just read the last chapter. <laughs> just skip ahead and read the last chapter. It'd be great if, yeah. if, 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 if like someone like buys it and just reads that one chapter and says, okay, I'm done. Yeah, they were like, great book. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> Couldn't put it down. That it took last me three chapter, minutes. nailed it. The rest of it, I have no idea. <laughs> no idea what happened, but that last chapter was nailed so it. great. Absolutely nailed it. <laughs> yeah. um, 
What are some of the other things that you touch on in the story? I touch on a lot of stuff that you wouldn't know about as an Olympic athlete. So the public eye sees us once every four years on your television screen and you see us win medals and smile and get our medal at the podium and it just seems all like very rainbows and butterfly-esque. It is not. Like it is a dark <laughs> journey to that podium. And, and not in a bad way, but like with anything that you're striving to achieve, there are ups and downs. And I don't think that many people are aware of those ups and downs, especially as Olympic athletes, um, because we aren't really in the spotlight like an NFL player or an NBA player. And so I really dive into the mental aspect of being an Olympic swimmer. And I think that's important because I think a lot of people don't understand how important it is to be mentally strong and mental health is huge and, and it's taboo kind of still in the swimming world. And I think it's something we need to talk about more. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so I talk about that a little bit, nutrition, um, adversities, injuries, just doubts, failures, um, a lot of sad stuff, but it's a bright book. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't just cover the highs. I also cover the lows. And I think that's an important part of my story. And I, it wouldn't be my story if I've left the lows out. Okay. So. I want to ask about doubts. Mm -hmm. um, how do you overcome those? And what are, and what are um, some of the doubts that you've experienced personally? Yeah. I mean, doubts, if you're human, you doubt yourself. Um, it doesn't matter if you're Michael Phelps and you have 28 Olympic medals or you're just me, you know, um, everybody has them. And for me, I always try to set myself up for success, which we all do. And I do that by doing something every single day that my future self will thank me for. And if I'm doing that consistently, I will have less doubts when it comes to race time or when it comes time for me to perform or give a speech or whatever it is. And I think it's honestly confidence and believing in yourself is so important, but it's so much easier said than done. And it's something that we all need to work on every single day. Um, and you know, I would do that. I get my confidence from knowing that I've put in the work and I've read through it 23 times before I put it out onto the shelves or I've swam hours and hours in a pool before I've raced it. And seeing all this for the first time, what would you tell them? Stop comparing yourself to others. You know, like stop trying to be somebody that you're not. Um, and I think that was me at my first Olympics. I was trying, to, I was a sponge. I was trying to absorb what everyone was doing and rightfully so, you know, I'm in the dining hall with Usain Bolt and Serena Williams and all these people that I idolize and I want to be like them. But again, like I was saying earlier, sometimes that doesn't work. And so for me, it was, it should have been me observing what they were doing, but also knowing what worked for me and what didn't. And I think comparison is the root of all evil when we're trying to be our best. And for me in the swimming world, I would always stand up on the blocks and look at the girl next to me and the girl on the other side of me and compare myself to them. You know, they're so much stronger than me or she has a faster time than me. And that doesn't matter because at the end of the day, it's about what I do in my lane. Like I don't control what they do. And so I would definitely tell a little girl um, that it was in my position just to focus on yourself, stay in your lane. Don't worry about anybody else because you don't control them. You only control yourself. But still, meeting your idols, that must be awesome. Oh my God, so cool. <laughs> it was, I, honestly, I will tell you, the dining hall at the Olympic Village is by far the best place to be at the Olympics because every athlete needs to eat, right? And there's only one dining hall. So if Usain Bolt needs to go eat, he's going to the dining <laughs> hall and I'm going too. And so I actually, speaking of Usain Bolt, it was, he's like my cool story about the dining hall. It was my first day, I'm 15 in 2008. And the dining hall is massive. It has Mexican food, it has Asian food, it has American food, it has food from all over the world. Um, and I was in line to go get some Mexican food and this man was in front of me and he was six foot eight, massive, in a Jamaica tracksuit jacket. And I was like, is that Usain Bolt? And sure enough, he turns around and it's Usain Bolt in line in front of me. And this was my first experience in the dining hall and I was like, I'm literally staying here all hours of the day if I can. It's just, <laughs> it's so cool to see the people that you idolize and you see on TV doing amazing things. And then it's kind of like a, a shock 
remembering that, oh wow, wait, I'm here at the Olympics on the same stage that they are. This doesn't seem right. Like, I don't belong here, but it is really cool to meet your idols and meet amazing athletes that you look up to. Talking to them, did you get the chance to actually say hi to them, introduce yourself? So I, I didn't talk to you, Saint Bull. I was in shock. I, I, I just like couldn't. Um, but I have met like, honestly, once I got a little bit more confident and wasn't 15 years old, um, I would approach people and just, I wouldn't want to bother them, but I would just say, hey, you know, Serena Williams, you're amazing. Like I really look up to you. Thank you for what you do for sports and women. Um, and so I think if I have an opportunity to say something to an athlete, I will. Um, but you always have to be careful if they're like in the zone or preparing. Yeah. So you always have to be cognizant of that. But yeah, I say hi to everybody if I can. <laughs> I would be so terrified to do that. I'd be like, yeah. nah, I don't want to bother them. They're, they're, they may be in the zone right now. I like, know. What if, what if, what if. I'll just I'll stay back and be cool. Yeah. I know, I know. But then you're like, oh, was that my one missed opportunity? Like, will I ever see them again? So I've got a chance to meet one of my heroes. Who? Um, uh, Brian Keane, he's um, a horror writer. Awesome. And he's, my favorite books are his books. Yeah. And I got to meet him at a book signing, and I was like, oh my god, it's him. It's him. <laughs> what do I do? And I'm like, okay, Max, be cool, be cool. Right. Just a dude, just say hi. And I think I actually played it pretty cool. I was like, you, you know, big, 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 big um, a fan of your work. Can we get a picture? He's like, absolutely. Yeah. Internally, I think I was screaming. Oh, you were absolutely freaking I, out. I, I, I was like, yeah. oh my god. No, what is happening? But you, but you made a good point, though. You know, like, he's just a dude. You know, we're all just people, you know? So sometimes you just have to remember that, and that might help your nerves. I don't know. Do you ever get people um, approaching you, and they seem so just like, terrified to like meet you and say hi and interest themselves people will be very apologetic and well they're like i'm so sorry but like i love you like i'm such a fan and i'm like don't be sorry like please say hi you know i'm so i'm i'm a, an extrovert so it doesn't bother me <laughs> i like talking to people i can tell yeah right but I, I do get it like it is i've been in their shoes like it is very nerve-wracking meeting somebody that you look up to um but i love it when like little kids come up to me and they just have no fear they're like, hey, you're awesome, and will you sign my book, and will you take a picture of me? And I'm like, yes, I love that. The confidence is great. Yep. So I think we all need a little bit of that in our in ourselves, for sure. Kids have none of like the social f phobias that we develop no. later on. It's crazy. Just, there's no filter, no fear, yep. and yet when you yet when they're like teenagers, it's all the fears. All the fears. Oh my God, forget about asking somebody for a picture. Oh, Which no. was me when I was 15. I was right. like, I'm not talking to anybody. <laughs> I'm like going in my corner and hiding. You're right. I'm just going to go here, sit down, yeah. and eat. I'm not going to bother yeah, anyone. Yeah, right? Oh my god. What is next for you? Now that this book has been out for uh, almost a year, mm -hmm. what's next? So, actually exciting news. During quarantine, or the height of quarantine, I guess, in the spring, in April, I officially got a job with NBC. And I'm doing sports commentating for them. Wow. And I was supposed to be at the Olympics this summer, but obviously that was postponed to next summer. So fingers crossed, everything goes well, and the Olympics do happen next summer. But if you turn on swimming, you'll hear my voice. So that's that's what's next. That's awesome. I know. You I'm know? really excited. Uh, like like, so so as one who has done this for a number of years, how do, how would you approach commentating it? Do you? give all this kind of like insider baseball talk? Yeah, so so my job is what we call color. Okay. And so I am, they kind of bring me in the booth with the analyst and he more calls the black and white things. Like, oh, she turned first at the 50 or she went this time. Whereas me, I talk about the turn and I talk about the technique and what they're feeling before their race or I talk to the coaches on deck before and you know, give an inside scoop as to how Max is feeling before his race tonight, you know. <laughs> Absolutely terrible. Right, right, horrible. But um, it's it's really exciting for me because I love swimming. Like, swimming was my life, and I really missed it once I retired from the sport, and I knew that I wanted to stay in it, and I majored in journalism at the University of Florida, so I kind of knew this was the path that I wanted to take, um, but I never honestly had time to pursue it because I was swimming. And so once I was done swimming, I started doing a lot more media stuff and building up my resume and doing stuff for free because I had no experience. How could I ask for money if I've never done it before? Um, and sure enough, that turned into me getting more comfortable with it and getting better at it. 
um, and I had an audition with NBC back in January. Um, and ironically, they called me on Friday the 13th in, of March <laughs> when uh, coronavirus was named a pandemic. And they were like, hey, you got the job. I was like, awesome. And then COVID obviously took over. And then a couple weeks later, Olympics were postponed. So it was crazy. It was like a high and then a low. But yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to be a part of that team. Do you think there's a new book? I don't think so. Not, really? not yet. Okay. Not enough has happened. <laughs> like, Fair enough. Like, I don't really know. Like, here's me doing another free journalism gig. <laughs> like, and, and maybe that will be what the next book is about, is kind of reinventing myself. Because for so long, I was Elizabeth Beisel the swimmer. That was what I was known as. That was kind of who I was. And then once you stop your sport, and for me, which was swimming, I was kind of like, who am I now? Like, what do I do now? You know, yeah, I have Olympic medals and I'm one of the best swimmers in the world, but like, what does my resume say? Nothing. Uh, and unfortunately, people don't care how fast you swim your tuner backstroke in when they're hiring you. So yeah. <laughs> for me, it was like, okay, like I am in the real world now. I need to start building my resume and doing things and getting more experience. And that was kind of what I did for the two to three years that I was out of swimming building up to the audition for NBC. And now that I have it, I'm like, oh, thank goodness. But, you know, it was a lot of grinding and doing a lot of work that sometimes I didn't want to do, but I knew I had to. So you put in the work and it always pays off. I imagine that that is a fear for a lot of athletes too, because it, especially if, uh, if they get into this so young, they don't really have like a plan B in there. And then, and, and then they retire at like, you know, 24, 25, it's like, okay, now what? Yeah. And it's not like there's a lot of opportunities for someone who, whether whether they do like the high jump, swimming, what have you, it's like, okay, now what? Yeah, and I think for Olympic athletes, especially because we're not making the money, so it's not like I have a nice little nest egg waiting for me when I'm done swimming, like, no, I need to like get right back on the horse. Um, whereas other athletes in different sports might be making millions of dollars on their contract. Mm -hmm. um, and so for, for especially swimmers in the Olympics, we kind of need to face the harsh reality of, oh, wow, we were somebody in this world and now we're out of that world and we're nobody. And we need to work our way towards what we want to become now. And that's not a swimmer. It's X, Y, and Z. So it's, it's hard, but if you, swimmers are tough and I think all swimmers can make that transition. Some, some are, may get harder or easier than others, but you'll eventually get there. All right. What's, this, uh, what's the significance of the book's title? Okay, I love this. So it's a little play on words. So silver is the highest medal that I have from the Olympics, and that was my first ever medal won at the Olympics. Um, so silver medals obviously play a special part in my life. Um, and then silver lining, just the phrase, I think is the key, like, behind the scenes theme of the entire book. Um, and we were talking about it earlier, how I discussed not just the highs, but the lows, but it's, it's nice where every low ends with a high and ends on a happy note. And so it's kind of one of those things where, wow, this was such a bummer that this happened, but the silver lining is this. And so you kind of always leave each chapter feeling really good and it, it redeems itself. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Well, Elizabeth, uh, this has been great. I've loved talking to you. Thank you. Folks at home, definitely get your copy of, of the book. Where do folks go to learn more about you and follow your work? Yeah, okay, so my website is very simple. It's elizabethbeisel.com. Uh, you can't mess it up, and everything that you need is there.